Before we open discussion to the floor, I wonder if the, the panelists themselves will want to comment on one another's presentations, interrelations, disagreements, possible further directions. Am I, am Please I go ahead. Can I ask yes. a question of, of Carl? So I completely agree about the importance of hypothesis spaces. That's the, the, big, the big thing of the, the normative model that I, that I mentioned. The thing I've been wrestling with most recently, though, is where do those come from? Why these hypothesis spaces rather than those? And are, are there, is that itself, do you think, something that could be, for which there could be a free energy minimization procedure to say these hypothesis spaces rather than those? Yes? Yes. OK. <laughs> That's easy. So uh, I guess what you're talking about is structure learning, which in, in the Bayesian world would be Bayesian model selection, which minimizes variation. I was just, oh yeah, I just have a quiet English voice. Um, yeah, so um, in, you know the answer, but in um, the world of statistics and inference, the problem of identifying the right structure or the right model or the right number of cards to keep your eye on is known as the problem of structure learning or Bayesian model selection, selecting the right structure on, among competing structures, Bayesian model comparison being another, uh, another name. So almost universally, people either use variational free energy or proxies for that, such as the Bayesian information criteria or KK's information criteria for that. Can I answer the question? Yeah. I, I, just because of your focus on reducing uncertainty, my focus on reducing uncertainty, I'm wondering, so just to summarize then, tension, musical tension, is basically inducing an uncertainty about where you're going based upon your knowledge of music and then dissolving it. Is that, that, that's correct. Okay, yes. that, yes. That's a nice point of right. contact. Um, yeah. So, but in, in your view of things, uh, in your view of things, uh, music is really extended in time. And so, uh, you really have these expectations that develop slowly and they can be, you know, partially fulfilled and then maybe finally it gets resolved. But what kind of brain mechanisms might we be able to identify that have that quality of producing these longer term expectations? Well, the, um, the predictive coding scheme that I showed you is probably exactly what you would want. It is interesting that it was actually invented for compression of audio files. <laughs> so the predictive coding was invented in the 1950s. Uh -huh. Not given that nice Bayesian gloss that I was trying to give it, but in terms of the actual, uh, the actual algorithm, uh, it was there to compress uh, things yeah. like .wav .wa files uh -huh. exactly to pass around music. Uh -huh. uh, so I, 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 that would be, so Bayesian filtering is a bit like a Bayesian inference engine, but given legs on time, dynamically. I think what you need to have it work properly is a sort of, uh, the sort of um, Bayesian protein schemes that are used for voice recognition that, that may or may not have a deeper hierarchical structure to them. I think that's what you were speaking to. Mm -hmm. to I don't know if you want to comment from the machine, with your machine learning hat on. Uh, yeah, no, I mean, I think that that's right. I think also that would be an argument for um, <clears throat> some of the things having to do with, uh, you know, why we need so many neurons to do the predictive coding because part of what it's doing is it's retaining history in the very coding so the the distribution can update over time in a very dynamic way um, and can do all of the kinds of tracking of the changing distributions that you were talking about i mean that's one of the one of the big challenges in machine learning is exactly how do you track in a non to use the statistical jargon in a non-stationary world how do you track such that you're actually keeping up with the world changing but not responding to accidents or those errors, right? I mean, if you have a, somebody who's trained as a music, you know, trained musician, somebody can mess up one note and it doesn't entirely throw them off and make them go, oh, the key changed. They recognize it as an error. And so how do you, from a machine learning point of view, how do you in real time uh, adapt without being caught in accidents or, or noise? It's a, it's a challenge, but I think a good one. In terms of your idea of fit, I, I made a note that I was going to try to remember to say this when I was talking, that um, one of the experiments we did very early on was with Indian, North Indian, Hindustani music, 
with Western listeners who had no prior experience. I mean, you would be really surprised how quickly people find those important tones in completely unfamiliar scales. It was really remarkable how quickly they were able to update. Yeah, no, I think that that's, and in that sense, I think it'd be interesting to look at, for example, how quickly people can adapt to new um, visual, for example, mm -hmm. uh, scenes and how quickly you can learn the natural statistics in a new, a new environment. If you've never been in the desert of the American Southwest and you're suddenly dropped there, I would imagine people acclimate incredibly quickly to the, the natural visual scene statistics. And I would think the similar, similar sort of thing is presumably going on with sort of auditory scene statistics in as much as that's a notion. Uh, people learn probabilities really fast when they don't think they're learning probabilities. Thank you. Let me throw this open to the audience. I don't know if any of our postdoctoral fellows want to raise any issues about Andrew. Yeah. Speak, speak up. It's terrible acoustics with the fans. Easy question. Um, I, I guess I'll, I'll take a first stab at it. I mean, in terms of the question of where goals come from, um, I, I think that they come from a lot of different sources. I tend to think of goals as um, being closely tied to valuations of the world. And those can come from everything from biology to cultural history to personal experience. Um, that I can have the goal of, of having a drink of water because of something about my physiology right now. I can have the goal of becoming a professor, which is a much more long-term goal. Um, I do think that, you know, there's, uh, I think there are, are difficult questions about the dynamics of goals and how they shift over time. Um, that, uh, you know, I, I think, I haven't yet figured out how to do it in the predictive coding variational free energy, but I've been starting to think about that with a student, about um, trying to model changes in value, uh, not just changes in probabilities. Now, the, the tricky part is that there's mathematical uh, theorems that say anything you can do with values, you can do with probabilities and vice versa. So there is a kind of uh, underdetermination problem that, that we're trying to wrestle with, but I think there's you can nonetheless, if you keep them separate, you can think about these as tracking in different ways, even if you interpret them ultimately as part of the same system. So, I mean, I think it's a great question. Um, I think sometimes we change our goals because they're realized. One goal's realized, so we move to the next. Other times we realize we can't satisfy them. And that's the one that I think personally I'm most interested in is how do you decide to give up a goal? At what point do you say, okay, I'm not gonna try to do this anymore? Um, because I think that that's, that's I struggle with in terms of, you know, you're always going to have prediction error. The world's a noisy place and it doesn't always bend to your whims. Uh, how do you know when to, when to move on? Um, Carol, do you want to comment on this topic? Well, you know, it's hard to talk about what the goal of listening yes, to music it is. is. Yes. <laughs> it's really difficult. And people take stab in an evolutionary direction that uh, somehow or another creating music and helping people to coordinate behavior with one another helps or uh, signals uh, sexual fitness by being a good musician. Or really, so uh, there's that direction. Um, I think that just personally, since I'm a cognitive psychologist, that we listen and make music and respond to music with our bodies because we enjoy something like this expectation, fulfillment, the tension, the resolution from tension. And it's really sort of playing with this, these basic cognitive processes. Carl, do you want to take that? Yep, so I've got a very clever answer that addresses your point, almost dissolves the question, and speaks to your last question about when do you give up. So 
what we've just heard, the deep mathematical theorem that highlighted duality between goals and beliefs is called the complete class theorem. That enables you to always cast a goal as a prior belief, a prior preference. That defines a model. So your question is where do models come from? Oh, sorry, your question, where do goals come from, is formally equivalent to where do models come from, where do you and I come from. So if you're a mathematician, they come from Bayesian model selection, which we've just spoken about in terms of finding the right hypotheses or fits. If you're a biologist, a theoretical biologist, that will be natural selection. So the process of natural selection over evolutionary time is a process of Bayesian model selection. So that the only imperative is that your phenotype that embodies your generative model, your explanation for the world, is a good fit with the world that you are born into, but of course you are also the author of. So if you can keep your world providing things that you can predict, by music, um, then you'll be well happy and that's where your goals come from because your goals define the model. The use or the um, just to highlight the use of the word selection here and why it's really crucial because I sort of slipped in natural selection and Bayesian model selection is formally identical and I, they are. So if you take things like replicated dynamics, they are formally equivalent to the Kalman filter, which is exactly the Bayesian, uh, uh, the predictive coding scheme that, that, that we were talking about a second ago. It's easy to show that. The other nice thing about the notion of, of um, Bayesian model selection is that we do it all the time as scientists or indeed choosing whether to have a latte or... or um, or a decaf latte. It's having a hypothesis space means very often you have to select your, the best hypothesis. So we do that as scientists when we do a t-test. We've got an alternate and a null hypothesis. And we go with either the alternate if there's enough evidence or not otherwise. So I think that the, you know, the question is when do we give up? It's at the point of that probability wave collapse that when we make, when we do a Bayesian model selection to resolve the uncertainty. And I fondly hope resolve the tension in the music at the end. So, so I think the answer to everything will be selection based upon Bayesian model evidence or free energy. Let me open this up to the audience more generally. Do you have a question to raise your... Yeah. Can you speak up? It's terrible acoustics. Yeah. I suppose one question is what you mean by a different type. Um, I mean, I, I completely agree that there is a large difference in the complexity of the tasks that are in front of you. And um, you have a lot less of an understanding of, perhaps, well, I mean, unless one's a far better writer than I, um, uh, much less understanding of the space of possible moves in the, in the writing case as opposed to throwing a ball. Um, and much less clarity about what counts as success. Uh, so you can't necessarily get into the right feedback loops to be able to improve performance in the same way. I mean, that's why students need to have certain kinds of feedback on writing and scaffolding helps and these sorts of things. So, um, you know, I, I don't necessarily always want to use the language of minimizing uncertainty um, because I, I tend to think about it in terms of the representations. Um, a bit more than than uncertainty over them. I'm not I'm not as Bayesian perhaps as Carl, um, but but I do think, you know, I would want to say that I think that there's at least room to be made for the idea that these can all be understood as the same basic kinds of processes, just remarkable differences in the complexity of the spaces, the complexity of the actions, the complexity of the uncertainty that might well lead us to think there's a qualitative difference, right? That, you know, a difference in degree can get so big that it's a difference in kind. Um, and this may be a case where, where it certainly seems that way. Uh, you know, dogs don't write poetry, but they solve, you know, the muscular tasks, so. Mike, you had a question. So on the question of uh, whether it's possible to Even mathematically, there's an analogy. Isn't it the case 
that sometimes we try to teach them to understand truth from in terms of goals that we can imagine interventions that change people's goals. So, for example, the problem we presented in David Deng's talk, he let us see some evidence and then presented the audience with questions and surprised us by asking questions different from the ones we thought we were going to be asked. But then we processed what we had learned in a different way, being assigned a different goal, or it might have seemed useful to what was going on, is said he could assign us a goal by asking us a question. Is it equally convenient to describe the processing that goes on in a case like that by saying he changed your prior about what the situation was? Uh, I guess, uh, for me, yes. So, uh, you know, task instructions are all about inducing good priors about, you know, in that instance, the, the task space and the hypothesis space at hand. So I actually find that a much more easy rhetoric to deal with, changing people's prior understanding or beliefs about the situation in which they find themselves. It doesn't feel quite as comfortable to say, I'm setting you the goal of. Uh, um, is there any harm in... Um, electing to use one sort of rhetoric versus the other? No, I don't think so. Unless you kid yourself, um, unless you over reify the notion of a goal. And without wanting to be unkind, the very sorts of questions that we received from the back reflect, I think, um, a reification of a goal. There is a deep tautology here, as there is in natural selection. Goals are not something you aspire to. They are things you end up on by definition. So in my world, a goal is just a statement about the preference of occupancy of particular uh, regimes of state space that characterize that sort of phenotype. It's not causative, it's not caused by, it doesn't cause. It is just a, a characteristic of. So once you put a teleology onto it by using the rhetoric of goals and preference and desires that anthropomorphize, anthropomorphizing it, can be helpful, but from a mathematical point of view, I think can be very distracting. So I'm very ambivalent about it. So that, that raises a question of principle about which parts of this conception you want to correspond to something psychologically real, and which is just a matter of mathematical description. What you just said about goals puts goals on the side of mathematical description, but it's quite clear some of these mechanisms are meant to be psychologically real, they get realized in cortical structures and so forth. Would you like to say something about that? I mean, what? Yeah, so... Oh, and, and you, why don't you start, Carl, and yeah, then go well, on, since... I, so, yeah. very much, uh, I mean, one can even extend this argument to the most formal uh, aspects of maths and statistical physics. These are just hypotheses. They are heuristics, if you like, yeah, that reflect right. um, our way of explaining our world, who we are and how we act, interact with our conspecifics. So, the real psychological aspects of these things are constructs. They're hypotheses, they're, they're the falsehoods that are the products of... Um, approximate Bayesian inference. Incredibly functional by definition because they work so well. Not only do they work in the context of natural selection, they actually work because we have professors of psychology who are experts in goal directed behavior. Um, but from the maths point of view, these, these are just um, models. They're simple, parsimonious, minimally complex explanations for the transactions that we have to explain in terms of what we actually observe. But some parts of the model are, have to be psychologically real in Carroll's account of musical perception, for instance, yeah, it's not just, not merely a description, right? It's a, there's actual cognitive structures that are explanatory of the perceptual, perce particular perceptual phenomenon, that this is a long way from the tonic, or this is close, and so forth. Yeah, sure. yeah, yeah, so, yeah, so it's a question of, um, you know, we, how much of a commitment one's making in um, saying this is, this is a correct model for this, with the, these are the goals, these are the prediction errors, what? what one would expect to be psychologically realized and what not. Um, maybe, David, it's a, it's a philosophical I mean, issue. I, I guess I'm, I'm, in some sense, I suppose I want to I want to push back a little bit and say, um, you know, it seems to me that Carl, wants, me. Carl wants to be relatively, you know, if, if the model works for us, then then good. That's, that's all there is. Um, I suppose I want to, and if I'm understanding your question right, Chris, you're pushing a bit more of, Something that I think I'm not suggesting, not imputing this to you, but could easily fall into a more sort of reductionist view, which is okay, we have these things that work at the psychological level, and we want to ask whether we can map them straightforwardly onto parts of cortex or activity in neurons or something like that. I suppose I'd want to push back and say, what about a middle road that says, 
what's important is to be clear about what we intend and commit ourselves to in theories, and that then theories can place constraints on one another, which might be as much as, you know, this piece of psychology is realized in this piece of cortex, but could also be sort of high-level constraints. I mean, I think Carl's models give us very high-level behavioral constraints of how we should expect systems to behave um, without necessarily giving us mechanistic details about how they necessarily realize that. Though, on the other hand, your model of saccades was presumably, I mean, you put it up there as though it was saying, this piece of cortex is doing this operation. So it seemed as though you were allowing at least a partial reification of some of the pieces like prediction error as a very, you know, it's a thing that really yeah. is being passed back and forth. Yeah. So I guess, you know, at the end of all of that, what I would say is, it seems like it's a matter for science. Um, I, it wouldn't bother me if goals, in fact, are a very real thing that is different from uh, prior beliefs, even if mathematically they're transformable. They may actually be realized differently or embodied in some different way in our, in our brains. I don't know. I mean, I don't think anybody knows the answer to that question yet, but I think um, I wouldn't want to take it off the table. I'd say we should ask and see whether we can find a very real difference. Uh, maybe it's there, maybe it's not, but yeah. I'd like to ask. So. Is that what you meant by a real psychology? I, I think I misinterpreted the question because I agree entirely that the process theories that conform to the principles at the different levels that we've been talking about them are really up for empirical grams, absolutely. Yeah. Predictive coding is one of a universe of schemes that may or may not be actually processed or done in, mm -hmm. in the brain, and only empirical evidence will, will, will say whether you know, it's a plausible hypothesis yeah. or process theory. Did you mean the same in relation to psychology? Because you can I certainly think psychological process as a process theory of what these schemes can do is a very real description. Did you mean it as a process theory? Yes, yeah, something like that. So you're quite right. There's the issue of neurophysiological realization. There's also a question of psychological reality, whatever the neurophysiological realization is. So in the case of psycholinguistics, we've become extremely familiar and comfortable with the idea that, for example, um, different grammars can generate the same set of uh, well-formed sentences, and it could really be psychologically real matter that this person is using this rule in their grammar rather than another, and there'll be probes and ways of testing that. And so Mike's question, I should imagine that there can be a question sometimes of a goal being psychologically real, you could intervene in certain ways, there'd be certain patterns of effects of intervening in a certain way um, that wouldn't be there if the goal were just just a kind of mathematical description of a certain kind of complex network of relations. Um, that, that's what I had in mind. Um, so that question arises even in relation to the psychological level, let alone, you know, it's always nice to go down to neurophysiological if we can, but yeah, they seem to be um, several different projects there. One is describing these, these relations, another is which, which parts of the, um, the mathematically specified structures are really psychologically real. That's, and that seems to me a genuine, a genuine question. Um, so you're no nodding, that's yeah, okay. No, but, yeah, I, think, yeah, I think that's yeah. right. I, did, uh, I would add, I think, figuring out what it means to be psychologically yeah. real is a very hard challenge yeah, also. Yeah, yeah. Um, I think it's, it's a lot easier to talk about this neuron fired or not, uh, what it means to have a representation, to have a goal, to have beliefs. Uh, I think that's a very difficult. I think that's yeah. a hard question. So. Yeah. Yes, question from the audience, yeah. Speak up, please, it's really... Yeah. just so it was clear about the nature of the hierarchies that are represented in the tonal piece space model of Lairdal. It You can see parallels between that and various kinds of grammars, grammatical representations. So as far as I know, no one has done tension experiments with words, except we did. We took a corpus of old sentences where we had the diagrams and counted the depth of embedding of each word, and then we presented them in a survey. Uh, what was the word, we, the phrase, we, the sentence we loved? It was, uh, after that long, cold winter, everyone was fed up. It was, we did this 
we did the same last. Thing you. <laughs> yeah. And so we had people judge how much tension for each word as it was sounded. And we had a sort of artificial speaker, so it was us saying it. And there was a nice strong correlation between the judge tension and the depth of embedding of the words in the sentence. So I, I maybe other people will do this, I don't know. Do you think that there's a possibility that if non-native speakers of the language were sort of situated to That's a great idea because we were surprised that people picked up the hierarchy so easily in a completely foreign style of music. That would be really interesting. Any other questions? Or, yeah, and um, another of our postdoctoral fellows. Yeah. Yeah, go ahead. Spe again, it's really hard to hear up here. Just shout. Yeah. Yeah. Right, so is the question about why a parallel isn't drawn between efference copying and corollary discharge? And, um, well, I think certainly from the point of view of Andy Clark and, and his reading and much of cognitive neuroscience, the emphasis uh, in the past five to ten years has been on perception. Whereas, of course, the notion of an efference copy and corollary discharge arose in the context of motor control. But there is a deep debate in motor control as well where um, there, I think, is actually a return to the notion of, um, of uh, well, earlier notions predicated or, or moving on from um, the equilibrium point hypothesis of people like Anton Feldman and extending that into the, um, into the sort of framework that I was discussing. What does it do for um, corollary discharge? Well, I think... Um, in a sense, the notion of corollary... Would you mind defining what corollary discharge is for, for, for the audience, just so we're, we all know what we're talking about? Could you define what corollary discharge is for the audience? <laughs> um, okay, well, I'll make a stab. There's a subtle difference between efference, efference copy and corollary discharge, but basically, these are, if you make a motor command or a motor prediction, and you send signals to your spinal cord to cause motor reflexes, then at the same time, you also send a prediction to other sensory modalities that would predict the consequences of what would happen if you made that movement. For example, in a uh, retinal slip with an eye movement or um, actually an auditory input in terms of articulatory movements. So from the point of view of predictive coding and hierarchical Bayesian inference, everything is a corollary discharge. Um, to actually assign a special role to the proprioceptive command that is somehow distinct from the corollary discharge to another modality, I think subverts the symmetry that the um, predictive coding and active inference community would like to bring to the table. There is no difference between predicting a proprioceptive sensation and a visual sensation or an auditory sensation. The only difference is that the proprioceptive sensation can be fulfilled with the reflex arc. But functionally, from the point of view of inside, they're all exactly the same. So I can only imagine that, that you know, that's why it hasn't been emphasized as a particularly useful idea in the context of active influence of Anybody else? Yeah. Again, speak up, please. Yeah. In the fire, you, you say the, the merits and the pitfalls of this uh, approach will be explored. What are the pitfalls? <laughs> Perhaps you could each comment on that, if, if indeed there are any pitfalls. Yeah. 
Well, I think um, I think there's a I'll put on my philosopher's hat here and think more broadly. Um, I think that there's a pitfall in the form of actually, and I'll, I'll speak against my own idea of, of cognition as goal satisfaction. I think there is a if that's understood correctly, I think it's a very useful, interesting idea. I think it is exactly the kind of rhetoric that can be co-opted to purposes to, for which it was never intended. And I think that a focus on prediction, on errors, on doing things in the world, on goals, um, invites a, a focus on the pragmatic and not in the sense of American pragmatism, but in the sense of the, the everyday, what did you do today? That, um, as a philosopher, I have real concerns about. I think it's important that we step back and ask questions about the nature of uh, what we ought to be doing and what we want to be doing. Not just what we want to do, but what ought we do. And I think those are questions that, of course, can be cashed out in the kinds of prediction uh, issues that we've been discussing, but I think um, I have certainly seen in philosophy plenty of people who hear the rhetoric of predictive coding, the rhetoric of prediction error, and think that it's an attempt to, um, for lack of a better way of putting it, devalue the human, um, to turn the human into just a kind of little calculational device uh, that's just responding. Go back to the stimulus response behaviorism of the 1940s. Um, well, Teens. I mean, there's a long history of it. Um, so I think that's a pitfall. I think it's a pitfall that arises uh, not because the con not because the ideas actually lead there, but I think that um, there are a lot of people that clearly have interpreted them in this way, and I think that that's something that we we have to take seriously and recognize as a as a potential problem. So, so properly understood, properly expanded, there are no pitfalls. Is that right? No, I'm not saying there are none. I was taking a stab at wine. I'm, I'm leaving the. I took the low hanging fruit. I think okay. leave the rest for my. <laughs> You're allowed to do that. Analysis. It's permitted. Carol, do you want to comment on it? The, the pitfall uh, question. I, I uh, obviously uh, have always been interested and enjoyed doing experiments. I love doing experiments because I think you can find things out and. Um, I would say, in terms of this issue of how important goals are, one test of that might be to see whether that is one of the most useful ways to change behavior. I addressing things, making manipulations and experiments at that level, I think it, it is a test of whether that is the right level to be uh, thinking of things in terms of that's a, a useful way of carving up psychology or not. So uh, that's what I, would, what I would say about that question. Carl, you can have the last word. Yeah. Uh, I was smiling to myself because I wasn't sure whether I meant to ask me what are the pitfalls for the predictive brain, or what pitfalls might the predictive brain create for people. Um, <laughs> you obviously want to know what the pitfalls were for the predictive coding uh, uh, perspective. Um, just in terms of what are the pitfalls that it could induce, I think we can come right back to the, the recurrent theme here, which is the space of hypotheses that we want to explore. If it's wrong, and remember it's a process theory that probably is wrong, it could distract a lot of important intellectual, academic, scientific, and cultural effort from what could be a more fruitful avenue. So I think that's a big, you know, the danger of reifying predictive, I mean, predictive coding is just one of many process theories that do the high church stuff that we started yeah. off with. Uh, yeah. so. Okay, fair, fair, modest conclusion on this important topic. Um, uh, there is a reception now, and for some of us we can continue the discussion at dinner, but please can we thank all our contributors panel very much. Thanks.